Welcome, bienvenidos to today's core peer learning circle, which is part of a series that we're doing about grant reporting. Today, we're gonna to try to talk about some ways to communicate challenges as honestly and constructively as possible. These peer learning circles are a different format from our usual core coffee chats. They're more of a conversation where we can all share tips and learn from each other. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today, and we're joined by our colleague, Jane Conklin. And as you can hear, our core institute events are all held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation. Today, Stella Lauerman is providing simultaneous interpretation and Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now. She'll also translate your comments and questions in the chat. I'll just take a moment to um, give a quick overview of CORE. CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, which is both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. It has this mission and vision with equity at the center and is centered on creating these eight vital interconnected core conditions for health and well being, again, with equity at the center. Events like today's peer learning circle are offered as part of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. You can think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of core investments through which we offer an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities like this one for people across different sectors in our county to build the knowledge, the skills, and the systems that we need to fulfill our collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. We also wanted to just say a quick word about this format, the um, core peer learning circles. As I mentioned earlier, these are a little different from our usual core coffee chats, but they're still all about learning. They're designed to be more informal and conversational. And our conversation today is centered around the theme of challenges and how to communicate them in your grant reporting. So we're hoping that everyone will not only share questions for each other, but also tips so that we can learn from each other during this discussion. And our our theme um, is part of a series about uh, grant reporting that's partly due to timing. So this time of year is a, um, a time when a lot of fiscal years are ending and people have a lot of reports due to funders um, and maybe internal reports as well. So we're hoping that these sessions will be useful, not just for this coming uh, June 30th deadline, but in general throughout the year. So we have some questions that you shared with us during the registration process, and they include timing, when it's appropriate to discuss challenges with a funder, um, and then maybe related to that, when what's, what's an appropriate allowance for ramp up time? So maybe something took longer than you expected to get started, for example, with a new project. Um, we also got a question about when and whether it's appropriate to put um, something in writing about your challenges, might that come back to you in an in a adverse way um, if you're not meeting your grant deliverables and the timing that you'd hoped and, and expected? And then also how best to close the loop. So when you've, you've um, revealed or um, shared some challenges and you've tried to address them with some follow-up actions, What's, what's the right way to circle back to a funder and say, here's what we've done and here's how we've made some progress or maybe not made as much progress. So you might be um, sharing challenges and then subsequent challenges as well. So first of all, are there any questions that you wanna add to this list? Those of you who may have had a question since you registered or didn't have a chance to share one during the registration process? Feel free to raise your hand or add something to the chat. So any additions? Okay, I'm not seeing or hearing any. So I'm gonna stop my screen share so that we can see each other better. But Gisela will add these to the chat as we go along. 
So let's see if people have ideas about the first one, about the timing. When is it appropriate to discuss your challenges? And I'm wondering if whoever shared this question during registration happens to be on the call, if, if you have anything you want to add to elaborate on it. Or does anybody have some experience with this that you want to share? Has anybody had uh, a recent or even a long ago experience saying this didn't work out the way we planned and here's why? Well, sometimes a funder will invite this by specifically asking a question about what challenges have you experienced in trying to implement your project. And that's great when that happens because they are, first of all, acknowledging that challenges happen, which is exactly the case. We are in a reality-based universe with human beings and things don't always work according to plan. Um, but when that doesn't happen, it's still worthwhile trying to mention um, that while you've been doing your best to deliver on what you promised or expected or hoped to do, that sometimes things have gotten in the way. And as implied in, this, in some of the other questions, especially the looping back question, if you have a way to describe the challenge, but also what you're doing to address it, that's very reassuring to a funder, but it's also part of your own planning to try to, to address whatever's going on. So does anybody have an example of a challenge that you might wanna share with a funder right out of the gate? Did something, is something um, happening in one of your projects that you feel comfortable sharing so we can all think about how, how to communicate that to a funder together? Everybody's projects are going perfectly and according to plan. That's awesome. <laughs> what about something you've heard about that might not be your own project if that doesn't feel quite comfortable yet? I have I have a few. Hi there. Hi, Mariana. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Nicole. I think I worked with you 20 years ago or more at the Fesa de Mujeres. <laughs> when I first moved from Brazil. <laughs> nice to see yes, you. Yes, good to see you. <laughs> to see some reconnections um, here. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, yeah, so it's, I, I thought some ideas was like, oh, this shoe is more, but, but there's like, there's one of our, our uh, grants that we work with volunteers and it's part of the, the funding is to recruit volunteers and, and, we have not been successful in recruiting volunteers in the Monterey County. It has been really hard and for a variety of reasons. It's, uh, and um, so we, so that's, that's one of the things that we'll need to, to explain. And we did many efforts and have not been yeah, successful with that. That, yeah, anything where you're, you're trying to get somebody else to do something, either you know, mm -hmm. recruiting or participating or those mm -hmm. kinds of things. That is really hard because you, you know, some sometimes you do the outreach that's worked in the past. And, you know, especially post-pandemic, it may not have the yes. same feel, right? Exactly. Yeah. And there's a, a lot of our needs, our needs are like in field work. And now a lot of the like we used to be successful with interns and uh want to do be in the field we do like sustainable transportation active transportation and teach kids uh, uh how to ride bike and walk safety and uh but um but uh a lot of a lot of the students want to do something online and uh and there's transportation issues and there's um financial limitations and it's very different in Santa Cruz so yeah those are the challenges so uh, Mariana, could I ask you, you know, how did you learn all that about the, the barriers that people are experiencing to participating? Did you? We, we asked, 
we ask okay. yeah yeah when when and 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 i ask i ask the volunteer coordinator the time to just keep track of it so i think one of the things that um we could learn from this example is that if something isn't working out um, the way you had hoped or planned, what are, what are you doing to understand that issue? So as Mariana is saying, there are reasons and there, you know, there are valid reasons and there may be reasons that you had not necessarily worked into your planning, but can now try to adjust to. And so one thing you can do is report on what, just what you're doing to collect more information about why it's not working out the way you had hoped. And so it might be more systematic or less systematic or more casual, but it's still it's still useful to to know that about why something might be faltering a bit. Anybody else, Jane? I see your hand up. Yes. Yeah, so I was really excited by that example. So so from my background, I've spent a lot of time as a funder reading lots of reports and things like that. And one thing I'm aware of is. You know, agencies are often at that leading edge of when things are changing. So this idea of, you know, workforce changes or volunteer changes, kind of letting your funder know that because you have all sorts of inside information that's much more maybe current. You know, they might be kind of operating on a more conventional wisdom. And so for a funder to see that from one agency to hear about that, they may hear about it from another agency. So kind of all that information sharing really helps them kind of recalibrate recalibrate their expectations. Um, so I think sometimes as when we're at the agency level, we wanna present only, you know, what's going really well, but kind of sharing that sort of information is, is really a service to your funder as well as providing, you know, the context for why you may not be advancing as quickly as possible. So I think that's really an excellent example to share. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, the other thing I was thinking about with Mariana's example is sometimes, you know, challenges can have budget implications. So it's not just a programmatic delay, but if there are things that, you know, historically you've been able to get done um, with volunteer labor or with interns, which are less costly, obviously, than paid staff, even though there's supervisory issues. But, you know, oftentimes we tend to kind of separate budget from program challenges. And I think that's the other thing to think through, you know, as you're um, negotiating with your funder or, you know, reporting on those things, are there things that are going to make a difference in the budget long term? Um, so that's something to keep an eye on and maybe give them a heads up for because oftentimes those things get reconciled at the end of the year, excuse me, and, um, you know, it just can be nice to start thinking through if there are those kinds of implications um, early. Thank you, Jane. And thanks for bringing in that funder perspective, um, because I think, you know, the premise of this whole session and set of questions is that there's something a little embarrassing about admitting to a funder that things aren't working out or that you're experiencing challenges. But I'm, I'm really glad that Jane brought forward the fact that it's important for funders to know this from you um, and that there's value in um, being candid about challenges uh, and and I, I can't tell that somebody on our call or in the background. Okay, background, got it, thanks. Um, are there any other um, questions or tips or nuances of, of the timing of discussion, discussing challenges with a funder? that you'd like to bring forward or examples? Um, it's it's Patrice and okay. I was, hello. I was um, just gonna kind of add on to that little piece because I heard the part about, you know, volunteers and the difficulty with sometimes um, getting those volunteers, but I, I have found equally as difficult in terms of hiring staff as well or much of the same or similar reasons um, because of, you know, high cost of living here and what, what, you know, what wages, you know, are able to be for people. And again, if, you know, if you're starting a, a program or doing something new and need to add staff, that it, it's difficult to find someone and to find the right 
person and a challenge and a balance to like, okay, do we just hire somebody, anybody to get somebody in here? Or are we holding out to wait and see, um, you know, the right person to that, you know, what we're really, you know, looking for with the experience or the skills or whatever, you know, qualities. Um, and that, that of course is going to, um, uh, delay, I'm going to put my video on, um, delay, you know, everything getting up and going if it takes a while for you to, to, to hire. So then you're kind of a little further behind the ballgame. So I'm not, I'm not sure, because again, this is something that's newer to me, you know, I'm not sure of what the funder's perspective or expectations are in terms of how quickly can one get up and going with something that is new and you know how realistic those expectations are sometimes we find that you know we hear about things and they're maybe coming and we're maybe going to do this but by time it's all said and done and like signed sealed and delivered it's already two months past the date that things were actually supposed to have started so you're up and running behind the ball game before you even begin then you have to you know, get, get people hired and, um, you know, try to get started with, with the work. So again, not sure where the, you know, what's appropriate with the funder perspective on those things. But I, I do think in Santa Cruz County, Monterey County, we, we do particularly have a challenge with, um, with, the, with, with people and staffing, whether it's volunteers or paid staff. It's so true, Patrice. And thanks for bringing that forward. And I think, um, you know, HR systems, especially in larger organizations and systems are not always known for being flexible. <laughs> and so sometimes there are those kinds of wrinkles too that, um, you know, I was just working on a grant report actually that for a rural county where they thought that they were gonna be able to offer a remote um, work from home situation for somebody who had very specialized knowledge of different kinds of billing systems. And the system said, no, um, that needs to be an in-person job. And so it really limited their ability to recruit somebody and now they're way behind. And so um, that does happen. And it's not that nobody could have anticipated that, I guess could have asked, um, you know, in the past it had been possible, especially during COVID to have these remote hires and that policy had changed. But I think a funder would be very understanding about that, those kinds of scenarios where something um, and it and it, and you, uh, Patrice, kind of embedded um, a, an answer in your explanation of that, which is that getting the right person, spending a couple extra months to get the right person, mm -hmm. might pay off later in having, you know, everything go smoothly from that point on. So sometimes it's just a a trade off that you have to explain. Um, if you're lucky, your funders are familiar enough with, uh, certainly uh, California funders are familiar with high cost of living in a lot of places and how hard, how hard it is to recruit people, but not always. Um, so yeah, the, the match between your issue and, and your funder and kind of what you've tried to anticipate up front is always tr a little tricky. Any other thoughts on this? In our session earlier this week, um, where we talked about humble bragging, we did mention that you're not only restricted to communicating with your funder in these reports. So um, if there's something that's a significant challenge or a set of challenges, or you just wanna kind of get the feel for how this could be communicated, it might be worth just setting up a meeting and a conversation as opposed to waiting until a report is due. So just wanna put that out there. Um, again, that's gonna vary depending on the funder um, and the relationship. Did you have a pre-existing relationship? Is this a new funder? Is it a new project? Um, but but um, you could certainly explore how open they might be to meeting and talking about a challenge and working through it together, especially if, as Jane says, it has some budget implications. Now, again, that flexibility may or may not be there, but it might be worth asking. So a related question that came up, um, and may have been, a, this was a two-parter, is that uh, 
the question about when uh, might be an appropriate ramp up time. So related to Patrice's question, um, is two months into a one year project too much of a delay to recover from? Or you know, how much runway do you have to make some adjustments to your challenges? Does anybody have experiences or questions or tips with that? Um, just specifically about ramp up time for a new project. Sometimes if you're lucky, the funder has offered you a planning grant or a planning has, has anticipated that the purpose of the funding is to prepare for implementation, in which case it's probably a lot easier to say, yep, we're planning and we're learning. But what about ones where you have said, we're ready to go, um, fund us because we have the capacity to start this right away and then something happens. I don't have an answer to that, but I am glad you're bringing that part up too, because those situations occur as well, sure where do. You, you do, you have, you have everybody and you think you're a go and you're going and learning and people are trained. And then, well, you know, there's a lot of movement in today's working or volunteering, I presume, culture, and people don't always stick around and find other opportunities as they might need to do and so then it's kind of again depending on how many people are are in that you know project or, or that that particular um program uh that can have a major impact when there's transition um that happens and an unexpected change yes the team you proposed six months ago when you wrote your grant or your proposal may not be there when you're ready to implement at least not in the same form. So that can be difficult. And sometimes for great reasons, maybe somebody got promoted. And um, But what, what, what do people do in that situation? What, what do you try to communicate to a funder if you've, if you've been in something like that? Or, or if you were a funder, what do you imagine you'd want to know? What would you ask? I think of it as, you know, there's probably a lot of similarities with the last question that we we're discussing in terms of being able to um, articulate to the funder, like here was the original goal or the target and what we yeah. thought would be the timeline. Here's what we've, you know, tried to do or have done. And here are the you know, the obstacles or the challenges we've encountered. And then here's what we're doing to adjust or change course. Or I feel like that, and, and then I actually had to write a little bit of this in a report just yesterday, trying to also convey, it's not just unique to this, like some of those workforce challenges or, you know, staffing shortages that impact the ability to meet <clears throat> target numbers, like being able to say it's not unique to this program or this organization, this is, you know, happening throughout our community. So just like being able to give a little bit of that context as well, um, I think can be helpful. And then the, and so what are we going to do about it? What are we, how are we problem solving or strategizing to um, you know, keep finding different ways to, to do it? I think, yeah, I think this is a, what Nicole said is super important is that I always try to do is to like, yeah, not just explain the challenges, but really do they strategize and say, what are I going to do about it? And what I will do next time I would do next time. And I would assume if I was a founder, I would want to know, right. If, if this person doesn't succeed, okay. Sometimes we, we have to fall many times in order to succeed, but then how, what, are you thinking about what else you're going to do? Are you going to do the same thing? And so, yes, yeah, great important. Yeah, and, and again, if there's a context of turnover in an industry or a sector, as opposed to just in your organization, that's important to know. 
sometimes it's also thinking about kind of how long the grant is like what you know if it's a one-year grant and you get really behind and their latitude to get you know kind of understanding what the uh parameters of the grant are can you get you no know, cost extensions can you carry over funds into the next year those kinds of things are important to understand and sometimes that's you know, can be looking at uh, sort of your grant documents, it might be a phone call, I, you know, there's different ways to approach that, but kind of understanding to what are some of your options in terms of extending that grant or carrying those funds forward if you aren't able to get up and running. Yeah, that's a great point, Jane. And I know from working on a lot of federal grants and projects that there's even an acronym for no cost extension because it's so common. Um, with, with those big projects, so. Um, yeah, that's good to know. And it actually is something that with one of our programs that they are are doing and it's with SAMHSA, it's, you know, federal. And so um, um, they are in the, in the process of doing that. And all the things that you're, that you're saying, they're talking about what those challenges have been, whether it's staffing or, you know, whatever the challenges are. And then I know one of the other programs, um, we are working on a timeline as well to show not only, you know, where we're at and, and you know, again, maybe um, I wouldn't say not meeting goals yet because I can't say that we're there yet, but just to show the progress that we have been making and what that timeline looks like, because attached with that is some funding that is supposed to be being spent down. And maybe that's not moving fast enough, but you know, from with our, our judgment, we don't really want that to happen faster because we think that need is going to end up being a little later. So we don't want to do that just to meet, you know, these guidelines that were out there, but but rather to be effective for the program um, goals. And so we kind of were trying to put all of that in a timeline and, you um, you know, kind of map out a little more about what that looks like from our end of things. Wow, that's, it's definitely a challenge. And, you know, we've been talking about some things like hiring someone or recruiting volunteers where the assumption is if we had a little more time, we could do this thing that we said we were going to do. Sometimes there's a situation where you start down a path and think, oh, this isn't really going to work. Um, the way we thought it would at all. We need we need a different path, a different goal, a different objective. And again, some funders are understanding about that and even treat it in a spirit of learning and improvement. And yes, we want you to succeed. Great, glad you discovered that early on. Um, let's let's try something else um, and let us know how that's going. But that's also, um, I would say, not typical. <laughs> would you agree, Jane? But... You know, I think it just varies so much because I tend to think, you know, the goal of agencies in terms of serving communities are the same goals that the funder ultimately has, right? And so, you know, if if the agency is stuck, <laughs> you know, the funder is kind of stuck. Like they're, they're, the agencies are kind of the manifestation of the program in communities. And so I think there is a natural tension between funders and people are implementing programs. But um, you know, I, I but you're right, Nicole, there are some funders that are very kind of rigid. This is how it needs to be, or it's going to be, and they, they maybe have less. But I, I, I kind of feel like most of my experiences, particularly um, maybe the closer they are, you know, whether it's like a private or a local fund, funder, you know, the feds are a little bit harder because they're so distant. But I often find, you know, that spirit of collaboration you know, but again, that's my experience. Everybody has different experiences. That's such a good point too. And, and the other thing that makes me think of is that not only are some funders removed from the communities they're serving, not always, but it's like a federal funder can't be everywhere. Um, but also within a funder, you might be dealing with a, like a contracts procurement office that's dealing with the budget and they've got 
checklists and here's what you said you would do in terms of outcomes or goals. And you said that would be done by April, but now it's June. So there's that kind of thinking in, you know, contractual obligations. And they're just, they're looking out, they're stewards of funds. So they're naturally looking out for where did these funds go and what are we getting for them? Whereas a program office might be more amenable to uh, more flexible about let's learn from what's not getting done or not getting done on time or different scenarios. So sometimes that's a conversation that has to happen within the funder agency about the, you know, the tension between a contractual um, march towards objectives and timing and a more programmatic learning uh, learning curve. So. So it's just helpful to know who you're talking to in which, which context and whether they're talking to each other. Um, the next question was just expressing a concern about if things are not going well and your grant deliverables are not met, or maybe not, maybe they're going well, but they're just slower. Um, some a concern about putting that in writing. And so this gets back to our um, our earlier conversation. Sometimes you're invited to do that in, in a, a report. It's a section of the report. Um, but if you're not, um, what are some options and, and how comfortable should you feel in, um, in doing that? So as we mentioned earlier, sometimes it's worth trying to have a conversation um, and maybe have a conversation a get to know each other conversation early on if they're open to that before there's any sort of concern or crisis. Um, some funders aren't able to meet with or talk to their dozens of grantees at the same level, but that depending on the funder again, like everything does, that might be an option. The big federal grants often incorporate site visits or they used to, <laughs> there have been a little changed by COVID, um, to visit projects and spend time kind of immersed in their world and try to understand them better. That's a great opportunity for relationship and trust building. And of course, you're trying to put your best foot forward, but it's also an opportunity to just um, sort of gauge their, their interest in hearing about how things are going. Um, what, what other ideas do you have about things other than putting things in writing or before putting things in writing? Has anybody tried to have that kind of conversation with a funder? Either anticipating things going a little sideways or just a sort of, just in case, let's, let's be able to know each other better. Yeah, with, with our program, we often have these conversations because I have deep, built, long relationships with some of the founders that are in, um, in uh, and sometimes we are actually contractors, somebody else like it's the city that get the funding. And we so we have the relationship not directly with the founder per se, but with the city, whoever is managing the funding. And, and if we for seeing a challenge, like I can give us an example. So we, parts of our goals are to serve schools, serve second graders and fifth graders class, right? With bike and walk safety. So if uh, we say that we're gonna serve a number of students, but the classes are shrinking. So if there's one of the grants that we said, we're going to serve 750 students and we're gonna serve probably 700 students, but we serve more classrooms, it's just smaller classes. So we would contact ahead and, and just let them know, you know, just, hey, classes are smaller, we're most likely not gonna achieve the goal. Is there something else that should we do instead or we could do that or is that okay? And sometimes they say, no, that's fine, don't worry about, or yeah, let's adapt the deliverable. So that's pretty something that we do often. Those are great examples. Thanks, Mariana. And, and you've also raised another great point, which is that sometimes 
the actual funder is a couple steps removed from you implementing the work. So it might be something like that where you're not the direct contact for better or for worse. Any other thoughts about cultivating that relationship with funders where you can try to be more open about your challenges and more um, instructive to them about, about challenges in the work? You know, I really like the idea of building those relationships, but I think, Nicole, you made the point, you know, some funders just don't have the bandwidth to do that. And I know I'm doing some contract work with someone who's, they do lots of relatively small grants and they just don't have, you know, and they kind of sort of put in, put on the brakes for that kind of conversation. And as we think through, you know, talking about challenges, like a mechanism that doesn't have a lot of opportunities to really build those relationships and kind of think through more nuance and more context. You know, they may need to be approached a little bit differently in how you share challenges because they just may not, <laughs> you know, be able to kind of dive into all of the, the different nuances. Um, that's kind of a half form thought, but I'm thinking, you know, some grantees you or and funders, you have this just very rich deep relationship with and you can kind of have a really rich dialogue with them and others it's, it's much more challenging so it's hard to share as much that's you know. really true jane thank you i was going to say too we have similar situations where most of my communication is not with the grant funder but the people who are working with the grant funder usually it's the county and people people at the county and they're trying to meet the funding you know meet meet that those needs and we're trying to implement and they're kind of a middle ground but i know one of the strategies i think that um that we did discover i, I don't know if it's a strategy but we realized at some point that we were initially so focused on whether we were meeting or not meeting and what that was looking like and focusing on all these problems and issues that were coming up and realized we weren't doing that humble bragging piece and talking about the things that were right and that we were doing. So internally, we said, you know what, next meeting, let's just talk about all our, of our successes because if you're that other person, all you're hearing are the challenges. So the next meeting, we started talking about those things and they're like, oh my God, well, I didn't know. And that is great. And that sounds really good. And thank you for telling us that. And so we realized, wait, you, you, you kind of have to put both of those things out there, not just one or the other, because otherwise, how, to, how you know, what is the picture that they're getting? You know, they're only getting either the data or the communication that we have. So that really kind of shifted some things when we when we did that. So even though it wasn't like meeting all the goals, there was there was lots of progress and things that they they weren't seeing that they didn't know. So that's great, and it's such a great point that the you know the the objective, the way it's phrased, we're gonna achieve X by Y timeframe doesn't necessarily lend itself to capturing some of those, that incremental progress or those, those steps along the way that may have built some capacity in your organization or yielded a new partnership or identified a gap that you've now tried to fill in some creative way. So absolutely there are um, successes kind of embedded in overcoming challenges as well. Um, Juan, Celeste, Leanne, any any additions here or any any questions for the group Not at the moment? Yeah, but thank you so much. This has been super helpful. Oh, good. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Well, we had one more question that kind of wraps a lot of the up the things that we're talking about, wraps up the things we've been talking about, and that is. Um, how you how you close the loop on these challenges, and we've we've touched on some of this, but it's about how to uh, report the follow up actions um, that you've been presumably taking to try to get back on track or get on a different track. 
And so we've we've talked a little bit about, you know, as um, Patrice just said, reporting some of those interim successes or, you know, give, giving yourself some pats on the back for things that that have gone well and not forgetting those. So I think that's just a great, great thing to remember. Um, because just as um, sometimes a funder may not ask you or invite you to talk about challenges, they also may not ask you that specific question of what other successes have you had and what else is going right. So that's a great, great point related to that. Um, anything else about explaining the, you know, how you're responding? So you've, you've mentioned a challenge either in conversation or in a report, and now you're at a um, juncture where you have something to say about what you did. Any experiences with that or tips? You know, one thought I have again, like as a on the, the grants grant funder side, is oftentimes when I would when I review reports, I'm looking at the agency's previous report alongside their current one, and so I think sometimes you know they'll be like that that discussion isn't always carried forward. It's like, oh, here's this challenge, and this is what we're going to do. And then, you know, six months later, you get a report and that just kind of disappears. So I think sometimes, you know, kind of refreshing on what your last communication was with your um, funder and making sure that you kind of really do close the loop. And whether even if you try something and it doesn't work, like letting them know that, because otherwise it could just sort of <laughs> it's like, did that happen or not? So I, I kind of like that continuity over the reporting. That's a great point, Jane, and, and also a reminder to think about who's reading your report and trying to help them understand. Yeah, I think, Jen, that's something I've not always think about, actually, to look back at my old report, because sometimes you're still think like that's what you're doing now. And I probably don't even remember what we did. So yeah. it's very really helpful. I'm, I'm Thank you for saying that. I'm putting a note because now we have all the reports. Like, make sure. I really appreciate that. Me too. That, that report's it. done. Why would I look at it again? It's off my list. <laughs> but yeah, very good advice. Other ideas about closing the loop? Any other questions? Okay, well, we had, um, before we had this conversation, we tried to come up with some overall tips. And I think we've touched on these in the answers to the specific questions. So we had uh, maintaining a spirit of learning and continuous improvement. So that's directed at the people writing these grant reports, but communicating that to the funder to help the funder achieve that as well. So if your funder isn't already in a spirit of learning and continuous improvement, maybe the way that you talk about your challenges can help them get there. And then we also talked about not just saying what the challenge is, but trying to be um, as detailed as you feel comfortable in explaining how you're going to adjust and why you think that might work better. And, and maybe you don't have a lot of ideas about that. So you're, you want, might wanna invite some help in thinking through how to address a challenge that has come up. We talked about trying to meet with the funder, either a heads up meeting, This we think this is not gonna be on target or just a relationship building opportunity before any challenges ever arise, but definitely before the report is due, just so that there's some opportunity to discuss that before it goes into writing in a, in a grant report. And then one thing we didn't really talk about was sometimes grantees might be um, facing similar challenges. Um, so multiple grantees of one or more funders might be experiencing something that happened in a region or a place or um, due to a particular challenge or a natural disaster or something. Maybe there are opportunities to get together with other grantees. Some funders do this on purpose. They develop, you know, they have all grantee meetings or calls or a learning collaborative of some kind. And that's great because that's an opportunity to do all of this kind of work of realizing you're not alone in your challenges and trying to work through them together and get some ideas from other people. But if that's not baked into your particular 
grant or a situation, maybe you can create a little bit of a learning community if you know who some of the other grantees are or grantees of other funders who are working in the same area. Any other tips you wanna share with each other? So this is definitely a starter list. And while you're pondering those, let me just put in a plug for some other June events. We're only halfway through the month, so we've got a little more to go here. Um, next week, we are co-sponsoring uh, a workshop with DataShare Santa Cruz. Uh, that's about harnessing local data to create the core conditions. We've done all the other core conditions. This is the last one, which is on stable, affordable housing and shelter. And if you have not used DataShare before, or even if you have, it's an opportunity to meet with others in smaller groups and dive into a set of indicators related to a particular core condition and just ask some questions about them. You know, what, what's here, what's missing? How can we use this information? What other ideas do people have for information in this case about um, a stable, affordable housing and shelter? And so that's, uh, that's one op learning opportunity coming up next Tuesday. And then um, we have two more of these peer learning circles. So this same format of hop on, listen to others' experiences and tips, contribute your own if you're, if you're willing and if it's relevant, but you're welcome to just listen in. And so we have two more topics that are loosely related to reporting on your progress. So one is um, the one on the 26th um, is on data visualization tips. So that's just different ways to use charts and graphs and to make the data that you're collecting um, statistics or results of some kind pop in a report. And then the last one in this cycle is called Beyond Funder Reports. And that's some of the things we've been talking about is you're, you're gathering all this information to convey to your funder, but while you're at it, aren't there things in there that might be useful information for your board of directors or um, some partners or maybe a media plug or other, other audiences besides your funder because you've gone through the trouble to collect information about your results, your progress, your challenges, what's next. Um, so while, while you're doing that, why not use it for other purposes? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And so hopefully um, this format will lead to some others where we welcome your, your ideas for other topics to uh, discuss together in this way. And then we'll also announce some other upcoming events um, as we get them on the calendar. So stay tuned. And then we also wanna invite your feedback. Uh, we really use what you tell us in structuring these sessions. Um, we hope that you'll take just a few moments to share your feedback in either English or Spanish. And um, the survey links are in the chat. So please take advantage of those. And any other final thoughts or questions before we let you go? You know, Nicole, I had one final thought is sometimes uh, funders will ask in a report um, whether there are any technical assistance needs or interests. Mm -hmm. And that can be another way to kind of just, you may not even, it may not even be a challenge that you want to describe much in your report, but it can also be just a signal of something you're interested in. Like, I think that idea of learning circles with other grantees about, um, hiring or staffing challenges is something that, you know, could be uh, something that you could add in like a technical assistance need. Um, but, you know, oftentimes funders just don't know what their grantees are interested in or need, and they sometimes will add a field like that in a report. That's a great point, Jane. And if it's not a field, just like the challenges, maybe you can make it one. <laughs> So let us know your technical assistance needs. Don't wait for us to ask, but we will. Mm -hmm. And happy Friday to everyone. Thank you very much. It's really, really helpful. I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you.
thank you for being here and for sharing your experiences as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>